Welcome to the World Cultures Festival and we're very glad to have you here today. Today we'll be celebrating music and dance from around the world and over the next few days we'll be having lots of performances as well. So right now we are very happy to invite Dr. Larry Francis Hilarion to give us a talk on the age of explorations and discoveries, music, dance and cultural spicing up. So in case you didn't know, Dr. Larry Francis Hilarion is currently an Associate Professor of Music at the Nanyang Technological University of Singapore. He was recently appointed the Music and Cultural Representative of the Republic of Singapore in the formation of the Asian Traditional Orchestra in Seoul, Korea. Larry is also an ethnomusicologist, composer, performer and music educator. He is also the founding member, composer and music director of the Jazz Rock Fusion Group, Flamenco Fusion. So, without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Larry Francis Hilarion. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, before I get started, uh, to thank the uh, organizers of the uh, talk, uh, Ying Jing and um, Joy Lo from the National Library Board, who have made this arrangement to happen. So I'm very grateful to have me here to talk to you about this journey. I would also like to thank uh, Irene, Paul, uh, Miss Nora, uh, Miss Asli, Nazri, and uh, a dear friend from Australia, Elsa Sharp, for being here. And of course, you know, all of you. But this paper here, which is part of my writing, which I haven't finished, is dedicated to a very dear friend. Uh, unfortunately, he's in Australia. And he is unable to be here, Mr. Siva Choi, my mentor and a good friend of mine. So uh, I hope to publish this at some point. And um, before I continue this journey, the reason I played that sound you heard, I mean prior to that, you heard some background sound. It was deliberate. It was the sound of 1450 Europe the Spanish, the English, uh, the Portuguese, they were all listening to that sound you heard. And I brought in immediately the sound of that instrument and that is the lute. The lute which became the European lute, the Arabs call it oud, the Chinese call it pipa, the Japanese biwa, the Indians do dotara, the Africans Kitwara, it has one genealogy. It developed from that called the wood. And references were made in the Bible, 
references were also made in uh, religious Islamic texts and of course the Jewish Torah. So my journey starts today with the sounds primarily of the interrelationship between East and West, primarily the musical uh, uh, interrelationship. Let me just get on to this. Right, you, you must be wondering the title, The Age of Explorations and Discoveries. Uh, why this title? Um, I think the work on the interrelationship between um, the Europeans coming to the East and the assimilation of cultures have not been thoroughly researched. So I decided to look at uh, journeys done by great explorers, both uh, Europeans, Asians, uh, like the Chinese as well, the Arabs, the Indians, and of course the Dutch, Spanish, Portuguese, English. So uh, that was the reason why I wanted to have this title. Right, the focus here is primarily on, as I pointed out, uh, let me just see, the cultural sharing, the music more so, lesser the dance because I'm not a dance specialist and how all these have impacted Southeast Asia, Europe, from Europe and other Asian influences. Um, so if you look at it, the three sections that I'm looking at really is the Indians, Chinese and Arabs coming here in the early centuries. That is very important because uh, you can see traces of culture still being maintained. And my main interest in this paper is the European contributions as well. And finally, we mustn't underestimate the significance of the indigenous music and culture. Next, please. So, can you imagine the world before uh, the 1492? Why 1492 is so significant? I think. Keep this date in mind because this is a period of the great exploration started. And can we just move on? Um, because of Christopher Columbus, the discovery of the New World, I think um, the famous writer Felipe Fernandez Armesto mentioned that the year the world began. But I think, in my opinion also, it was this beginning, or is this the beginning of the end of the world? That is something that. I'm trying to wrestle with because of uh, the great writer, the Spanish writer, uh, Francisco Lopez Gomara in 1552. 1552, just after, just 60 years after Columbus's journey, he wrote the greatest event in the history of mankind to some degree, I will give you the quotation, was the founding of the new world. Can you imagine the significance it played? Okay, but I also say the founding of the new world brought carnage, brought massacre, destruction, etc. etc. It's, it's not here to discuss about um, the ethnicity or political factors here, but I'm pointing out important uh, issues in history. So can we just move on if you will see. See, the greatest event since the creation of the world, Francisco Lopez mentioned that 60 years after. But also, this famous priest scholar who traveled with Columbus um, mentioned the destruction and massacre Columbus and his soldiers did to the community. And the priest Las Casas appealed to the Pope, appealed to the King of Spain, and mentioned the carnage and the massacre, but nobody cared. So, uh, what I'm saying is that yet they claim that this is a creation that is so great, next to God's creation of people, I think. But something to wrestle with, something to think about. Do you agree with such statements? 
Okay, let's move on a bit. Now, um, here, this is an in interesting map which I've just come up with recently. Um, the world was divided into half. Can you see? The Spanish were given the westward journey, that's how they came to South America, Mexico, and they invaded the whole uh, western part of the atmosphere. And the Portuguese came on the eastern journey and they came to this part of the world all in search of spice. So the world was divided into two parts only. That is to say, half belonged to the Portuguese, half belonged to the Spanish. Fascinating. Shall we just move on? But the arrival of the black ship, you know the, the, the big ship in the first picture you saw, the, because it was so huge and black, the force, the formidable force was so unbelievable and the natives or the indigenous people saw, probably they believed it was God coming down to earth. White faces with the firepower of the cannons and the guns and also the formidable size and they thought it was God. God came to this world and that's why they were overpowered very easily in the name of God. But people forgot one thing. It was the Chinese who invented gunpowder. That was fascinating. And the Europeans in some ways used it in to, de to the destruction of the world to some degree. So let's move on a bit. But I'm not going to talk about the cultural genocide or the politics. I'm more interested in cultural intercourse, enculturation, assimilation, adaptation and intercultural understanding. I think we are here today in this present time to enjoy the sharing of cultures rather than uh, the destruction of cultures. So I think this is my important point on the race. Okay? So we will see the journey will be Southeast Asia primarily and the sharing of cultures. Can we just move on? Okay, so we look at the spice trade. They all came here, the four European powers, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Portuguese came in 1511, the Spanish came in 1523-21 with the find, finding of the uh, Philippines, more so in 1521. The English came probably uh, with Sir, uh, Sir Francis Light in 1786, and the Dutch in 1623. Uh, you'll see their contributions are amazing to some degree but all in search of the spice trade. That is the thing I'm calling on. The, the, the topic today is spicing up, cultural spicing up of the uh, indigenous community with the European uh, ideas. Let me just move on. So there you are, Spanish. Portuguese, Spanish, uh, Dutch, and English. Um, I'm not going to talk about the French primarily. Uh, they belong to the other side of the world. They missed the spice trade. And they went to uh, the mainland Southeast Asia. I will show you now of the mainland Southeast Asia. Can we just move on? Okay. So the differences in political and cultural perceptions of the European in search of spice but also conquest, subjugation, exploitation, colonization, all four played a part in this Southeast Asian nation, more so with insular Southeast Asia. But early Asian cultural impact was passive. The Indic civilization, Hindu Buddhist, was imported. Sri Vijaya Empire, Majapahit Empire, the Chinese. Uh, brought about in Champa, in Vietnam, uh, lots of cultural um, influences. The Arab connection, we cannot forego the Arab connections. They've been trading here since the 9th, even 6th century, as early as that. So, fascinating. This is fascinating from also the Asian perspective. What was the difference here? The difference here is, what was the difference? Uh, in the perception. Simple. They came to trade and to share. But some of the European countries came really to exploit, subjugate 
and the massacre he left behind. So you can see the differences here. I call it the perceptions are totally different. Can you see more? See, so the focus I'm going to talk about here is insular Southeast Asia. Uh, for some of you, you may not know the countries of Southeast Asia. I'm just going to just uh, go through again. Maybe they, can we move on? There you are. Uh, the countries of Southeast Asia, as you can see. Okay, you may know this already, but uh, let's just look at the map further. Uh, can we move on? There you are. This is the mainland Southeast Asia where the French penetrated. Unfortunately, there were no spies there. That is fascinating. Even in the Philippines, no spies. Only in southern Philippines called Mindanao. Fascinating. So the French attempt that way failed because there was no spice. Okay, now let's go on to the next map. This is the area I'm very interested in called Insulia, uh, Southeast Asia, where the spice trade took place. Not all, only here in the Philippines there was spice. Okay? So no spice up there. No spice. I call it paradise. But they spoke the same language, same practices as we look at the next map. There you are. This is what I call really the Lawotan Layu. As you can see, the Spice Islands are here. Okay. I'm very grateful to my friend who's pointed out there's a spelling mistake here. It's uh, for Timor Lesta. See, it, there shouldn't be an R. But I call this, I renamed this place as Lawotan Layu because the Europeans have named all these sea lanes, which I disagree. My point is that they share here a cultural trait that is very similar. So I don't want to know the sea lane, but I call the whole sea place as Lawotan, Melayu. Okay, can we move on? So why Lawotan Melayu? Because of a spice paradise, they share similar culture, the trade, the economy was piracy and trade, Malayic language, and also very important the use of gongs and symbols besides the spice. The spice trade was most fertile and attracted many people primarily from Europe to come here. So um, whether it's good or bad is not our point yeah at this stage. Okay, let's move on. So we have the bamboo culture, bronze culture, uh, pluck lute and bow lute and uh, drum instruments. So let's have some uh, pictures here, please. There you are. Look at this. You will find in my field work later on, I'll show you video clips. Similar kinds of xylophone instruments are found with, within many of the Southeast Asian countries. Fascinating cultural assimilation. Okay, from east to east, you will see west to east cultural spicing later on. Let's go on. There you are, look. And this bronze culture is found across many parts of Southeast Asia. Okay, is this indigenous? Good question. Next, let's go. Aha, the wayang. This is another important word, wayang. And the puppet play. Okay, move on. Uh, these are ancient gongs dating back 2500 BC in the borders between China and Vietnam. Oh my goodness, this one. This is amazing. This is all completely solid bronze. Is this a drum or a kind of a metal piece? Uh, idiophone, like you just beat on it, is it? Actually, it's drum. Why? Although it's not skin, it's metal, but the vibration is similar to the skin. That's why it's classified under drums, but they are fully metal. Fascinating, dating back as early as 3000 BC. Don't you think it's amazing? I found this in Vietnam. Move on. Chinese influences. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Next. Chinese influences. Drums. Uh huh. Chinese again. Interesting. You find this in many Southeast Asian cultures. Either Kendang, Kendang, and they have different names. 
in Vietnam, Burma, and in Thailand, but of the same source. Let's move on. Aha, uh -huh, there you are. Some more. In the gamelan, there you are. Now, this is interesting. Look at this. Guitar, tablas, markas, wood, tambourine somewhere in the violin. We'll see the performances later. Fascinating. What is this? What influence is this? Okay, this is the first stage of cultural spicing now taking place. European arrival. Indian, European, indigenous. Okay, the Arabian, fascinating. Next, uh huh, Arabian. That was the instrument. This is the real. Arabian one I played. This is from Palestine. I got it from Palestine. That is a Malay one. So you can see the same genealogy or same, uh, same genealogy, same development. If you don't understand, stop me because I think genealogy is a big word. It's, it's great. There you are. Look, this is fascinating. Uh -huh, look at this. Europeans now. Let's have a look at it. Now, look at this. Bass, guitar, keyboard, uh -huh. uh, ukulele type instrument, cello, there's a flute, violin, etc. etc. Fascinating. Now, what has happened here is the Europeans, the arrival of the Spanish, Portuguese, English, and the Dutch brought about the changes in the musical style to the countries of Southeast Asia and this is another form through the spice trade and the spicing up of cultures that is fascinating to watch we will listen this is no use I'm just showing you examples but watch the video later on okay but let me just keep to time I'm trying to finish as quickly as possible so you can go and have your dinner okay. <laughs> my stomach is also calling anyway there you are look at this Look at this. Does it remind you? What does it remind you of? You can see. But this is the chuk and the chuk. I was in Portugal and I found the original instrument that was brought here in 1500 probably. It's called cavaquinho or sometimes machate and they look quite like this. But dating back probably 1500. Fascinating. So, and this is has got a different name. You clearly has got a different name, huh? There you are. Now this can't be Asian, can it? Okay, so that's the point. Let's move on. I say, look at this. Look at this. Any chalice but uh, uh, double bass player is here? No double bass? No? There you see? Guitar time. Look at this. Look at this. Oud type. This is as well. La Oud. This is called La Oud. Meaning the Oud. That, that one. From that. Okay. Octavina. There you are. European influence. I'll leave you to guess. You guess that one. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. Look at this. Look at this. Look at the dressing. Dress code. Fascinating. Now, you know that I have uh, lots of my examples, but this is not the right time to give you everything. You'll be overloaded. For example, the word choke, the word ronging, um, and all those Portuguese dance. Krone choke. I mean, so much to learn, so much to see the kind of interrelationship, cultural integration. The word, right, nice word is the assimilation of cultures, and, and and this is a classic example. Now, that that is very Spanish, yeah, very Spanish, yeah. Okay, let's listen to the music afterwards. Okay, I'm going to just tie it up and and finish quickly and watch the video so we can have questions. Okay, short and sharp. I promise you. Remember, there you are. Now, this is interesting. Look at this. What is this? A box. This is a harmonium. Accordion, the lute, the violin, the guitar is there, and the, the flute and the stabla too. 
So this is fascinating. Okay. Now looking back now, let's let's just look back. The world today, if not for the great exploration, can you imagine what would the musical situation be, the political situation be, and the social structure of society? Can you imagine that? It's quite a tricky and difficult question to answer. Just, just looking at this, if we didn't have had this great exploration. So I decided to call the music from what I hear. It's like the arms and the dance, the feet. Because music is the arm uh, and the foot is the dance and it made that sort of assimilation. So I like to always remember music, I always told my students, cannot exist on its own sometimes. You need the dance, okay, and the dancers need music. But sometimes I wonder which is more important. Uh, superior to the, uh, subordinate music or dance. Okay, something to think about. Yeah, can you go? On? Okay, I have finally come to a conclusion in the sense that the fusion of early or uh, earlier foreign cultural influences, together with the distinctive uh, indigenous musical elements, has resulted in an original form of musical practices unique only to the cultures of Southeast Asia. And I think this statement can be challenged. Okay? And this statement has been published somewhere else, I can't remember, but I think it can be challenged. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take your questions. So this is how I felt that sort of integration and, and assimilation, sometimes we use the word cross fertilization, sometimes we use the word hybrid cultures so they all mean the same thing to me okay shall we just move on a bit so ladies and gentlemen I'm going to show you a short video clip and there I hope from that video clip it will make sense because you can hear it without hearing music is useless you must be able to hear it then you try and re reflect back to the the sound to the script and to the points I've raised just now. Then you ask me questions. Okay? So, shall we have a short uh, clip and then ask questions? Finito, go for dinner. Okay? okay. <laughs>
in your opinion. This is the sort of end of the journey. I spent 25 years on this trip 
and I'm very grateful to my students for inspiring me and also their work. Thank you students. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. That's the end of my session. So I will take questions now. So you want to? Hello. Hi everyone. So shall we thank Dr. Larry again? Oh, thank you so much. And right now we'll open the floor for questions. So if you have a question, just don't mind raising your hand. So I'll pass you a mic. Thank you. So is it going to be the same? Eh, ikong si Mia. Okay, no, 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 no. Oh, you believe? Eh, apa dia cakap? Huh? Apa dia cakap? Fantastic. So while watching the video just now, I realized. Uh, can you identify yourself? Please? Oh, I'm Yuzheng. Actually, I'm one of Dr. Larry's students in NIE. Yeah. So my question is that I observed from the video that a lot of these instruments are actually round. There's a lot of circles involved in it. So is there is there a link? why the instruments are in this, they are shaped in such a way. Like even the arrangement of the, the bonang like instrument is in a round mm -hmm. circle. Then it, for the wooden block it's also curved in a way. So that was the only visual representation that I saw that struck me the most throughout the entire video. Thank you. I thought it was a fantastic question. Um, I can only assume because I'm not an expert on those diagrammatic uh, philosophical research but I think the Buddhist concept of nirvana and going in circle is so very important because I talked about the Indic civilization in the early century of uh, 6th century, 7th century the Slendra Empire, the Sri Vijaya and the Majapahit more so the Sri Vijaya and the Slendra, the Buddhist Empire and they may have transported that form of uh, ideas, the Buddhist philosophy. Having said that, Ceylon or Sri Lanka and its Buddhism played a very significant part as well. And so you'll find the circle, the circular ideas are related probably to Buddhist philosophy. Uh, again, I'm only assuming from my studies, I'm making educated guesses from there. So new research should be done by the students. Fantastic. More work, guys, more work. Go slow, more work. Don't spoil the market. <laughs> Thank you for that lovely question. Martin. Mr. Martin. Uh, I was studying at Nassau 20 years ago. I, I played this, uh, uh, this Cameroon. So actually, I doesn't know about the the deeper meaning. So is it is is uh, associated with the Javanese, the Indonesia, the uh, is it this? Uh, why they play this? Because of the ritual, or because of for the religion purposes? Uh, Hindu, the, because I know uh, the Indonesian, they are worshiping the Hinduism. So more or less, uh, why they, they worship for some purposes? Is it? Okay, um, there are two parts to Martin's question. One is related to religion, the significance of religion in the practice of uh, culture and music. And, and the other thing is that uh, uh, political and uh, cultural influences from probably Indonesia. Um, having said that, I think we must keep in mind that simultaneous development of cultures took place. Southeast Asia, more so insular Southeast Asia, always shared their trait and their musical system so that is a very important point and bronze instruments like the gongs and the knock gongs are indigenous to these Southeast Asian countries you don't find it in India or China you see so I would say it is very much a indigenous practice so I hope you, you got that the ritual side the ritual uh, music is have always been part of uh, dance trance 
and religious practices. So ritual plays a very significant role in most cultures of Southeast Asia. Yes, in short, uh, there are more to talk about, but I, to answer your question, uh, the political side of it and being indigenous is definitely Southeast Asian too. The practice of ritual is very apparent in all these Southeast Asian countries. I hope it's clear. Okay, stop me if you don't understand. Okay, fantastic. Um, yes. Hello, hi, yeah, Jermaine, also a student of Dr. Larry Francis. Um, my question is, is there a place, I mean, to what extent should we welcome the assimilation of such musical cultures? Is there a place for protecting your own musical culture? You know, what if um, it gets very diluted, you know, I start welcoming all sorts of different instruments and, you know, is there a place for protecting my own culture? Uh, again, this is a very technical and very, very interesting question for me. Um, should we have protection for cultures? Should we retain that sort of uh, a museum piece for culture that this belong to us? Or should we welcome new ideas and excellent point? My belief system is, in that sense, I practice believing in cultures we should allow cultures to grow naturally. There shouldn't be any form of political interference or rules. Cultures develop as they go on. As you can see, the world is a global society since the start of civilization, I believe so. So, uh, whether we should re re maintain and, and protect <coughs> should pay less attention to that. Then we become too much of uh, uh, interfering with the sources and the practices and politics. So, interfere means politics. I dislike politics. <laughs> okay. Yes. I don't know if I put this um, rightly, but I'm just going to ask. Um, um, you took us through the process of uh, cultural spicing of musical instruments and music um, in Asia. So uh, I would like to know, is there an evolutionary process as well, where these uh, mix of instruments over time, that certain instruments actually get dropped off? Uh, certain instruments will not be used at all. Yeah, like yeah. over time and then the dominant instruments will remain and form mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. a new set of instruments. Yes, 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 of course that's a Again, the uh, questions are all very, very nice, very good. Well, um, we don't have to go far, right? If you look at today's popular tradition, rock and roll, blues and jazz, new instruments are coming all the time. Technology, yeah, techno instruments. Uh, but we have to allow instruments to continue developing and going on. Uh, all instruments will be dropped. Um, to what degree? I do not know. For example, we take the guitar. The guitar is a very, very new instrument. But it all started from the journey dating back 224 AD during the Sassanite period where the kumbus was invented and string instruments developed into that. And from that it developed into the guitar. So modification and developments take place. So I think uh, whether it drops out or whether it develops, we got to just let nature take its course like life. It just goes on developing. Okay? Thank you. Oh, um, Hi, Dr. Larry. My name is Darren, and I'd like to ask a question. Uh, earlier on, you spoke about uh, you know spice routes around Southeast Asia. Uh, I personally am a big fan of the Silk Road, uh, you know, within China and the Middle East. Is there something you can talk about from the musical influences uh, from the Silk Road, both from the European perspective and from the Asian perspective? Okay, that is another big topic. And next lecture. <laughs> well, I think this, this the Silk Road is absolutely important. Now the reason where the spice route came about 
I believe so. The Silk Road is much older journeys, primarily because the Europeans were not getting the supply of Asian goods. The the Asian goods were being stopped, and and, and in Venice, where the center of trade was taking place, European trade. So. Um, what has happened was they looked for another journey and they thought they found a new world and new all the new islands and new countries like Columbus's journey of 1492 but yes there are many many uh, cultural journeys that took place primarily not only culture <coughs> but musical instruments and um, for for one example I gave is that this instrument is a classic example of the journey to China the journey to China it became eventually known as the Silk Road journey called the Pipa and from China it went to Japan known as the Biwa so that Silk Road played a very important part not only in, in, in this and if you look at the Chinese um, uh, Han, not Han, uh, the Hokkien Pipa, the Nanin Pipa is played still today the Pipa is played uh, almost uh, vertical yeah do you know how Pipa is played? it's played this way yeah, but the, the old Nanin pipa, which is a Hokkien pipa, is played this way. And this is the right way of playing the oot, which I played almost that way. That was the ancient Chinese way of playing through the silk route, for example. Okay, but I don't want to make it a big issue of another topic or the silk route, but fantastic point. Another research question. Students, keep that in mind. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm Ting Kai. Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, I have a question regarding uh, cultural genocide. Because, uh, what is your definition of uh, cultural genocide? I, I mean, in my opinion, is I, I feel that the term genocide is a bit too strong a word to use. And in a case, I, I actually prefer it to be a uh, immersion of culture rather than a genocide of culture. So, uh, uh, I would like to seek your view on, on, on this term, cultural genocide. Excellent point. It's just challenged me. I like that. Cultural genocide is used tongue in cheek. I really don't mean in that sense. But let's take modern history Cambodia, which was Cambodia. The Pol Pot regime executed 3 million people, mostly intellectuals, dancers, musicians and I think three million I will consider all these smart people and intelligent people and dancers and musicians uh, some of them are fruitcakes too to be massacred like that I call it cultural genocide and this is done by the own people but if you look at the Europeans when Columbus went I quoted Las Casas. Las Casas, a priest, was with Columbus and he couldn't take the carnage, the, the uh, massacre of people. And in some communities, the whole society, musicians, dancers, cultural aspects of the carriers of their culture were all annihilated, completely terminated. I think that is genocide. I'm using politics to play politics as well, in that sense. So, um, how you look at it is, it's up to you. But again, it's up to you to whether to take it or not. Yeah, it's fine with me. But good question. Okay. Oh, hey. Uh, hello. I'm actually one of the students as well. So I'm asking that, okay, probably in the late 19th and the earlier 20th century where, you know, France, they have this some sort of world, this warfare where they, where they introduce instruments from Indonesia to France, right? And, you know, some of the composers that we know that, you know, they are influenced by them. But why do you think that, you know, uh, our instruments, you know, um, imported to the Western countries, they are not as, not as strong an influence as, you know, as the other way around? Oh, well, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. Okay, I'll give you a quotation. I'll give you an example. Uh, the question was, 
why our Asian music didn't impact so well on the uh, European communities. No, no, no. This is another area of topic. The Europeans owe a lot to the incursion from the Arabs. For example, you heard the music of that 1400 I played during your time of Columbus. Really, that sound is the sound of the Orient. The Oriental sound because the lute which became the, the sorry, the oud which became the Elizabethan lute used in many of the European music were a direct importation from the East. So they borrowed the, 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 the tambourine, the, the drums, the cymbals and the Morris dancing, the English have a dance called Morris dancing, the white pants and hat. It means, it's an English cultural dance, it means the more dance came from North Africa, Arabs. So, yet it is part of the English culture today. So, we have to re-examine history. Only when we re-examine history and look at a cultural exchange, assimilation and cooperation, we understand how musicians and artists and cultural experts enjoy each other's ways rather than fighting and killing and destroying um, or massacring the whole world. Okay, so yes, there was a lot going on that we do. And new composition, yeah, Debussy, Ravel, uh, uh, you, you, hundreds of them, or the great Tchaikovsky, you, you name it, yeah, Stockhausen, Harrison Bergwiesel, they all adopted the music of other cultures in their composition. So it's fascinating that if you don't move away from that mindset, then I think it's a solid state for art and musicians and culture. Uh, Dr. Larry, I think we have to wrap up the discussion. Yes, wonderful, so, um, I'm getting tired too. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. So if you have any questions, do look for Dr. Larry. He'll be hanging out at the cafe later. So, um, yeah. Yes, can I just say that, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you so much, especially to my students that you have inspired me, actually you. So thank you for doing that for me and the team. Thank you for listening. Cheers.